Tom, Andy. Hello. Hello. Lovely to see you. <laughs> Good, Good to see you. you. Yeah. How have things been for you, like like it has been for all of us over this weird time? Go on, mate. You go first. Um, well, it's been a bit, bit Groundhog Day, hasn't it, for all of us? Um, I've moved out here, followed Tom to the um, beautiful Gloucestershire countryside. So I guess not all bad. Yeah. Yeah. And for you? Tom? Yeah. I mean, it's been. Um, uh, a slog at times, um, then also wonderful at other times. Lots of family time, lots of dog walking. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, we moved out here Christmas before last, so before this happened. Um, that was after Andy and I had made the record. The record was also made before then, so, you know, it, it, both things weren't expecting such events to unfold. So to want to release the music, in this environment has been strange, uh, in some some ways nice, some ways really frustrating, but also just to have a new way of life, a new place to live, and all the things you want to do when you're somewhere new, um, that's been stunted as well by by what's been going on. So, um, yeah, conflicting emotions about the whole thing, really. And how do you guys feel now about we're gradually easing our way out of lockdown and almost going back to a new normal. We we spoke off camera about it was going to be really bizarre to even shake somebody's hand, isn't it? Mm. So we did elbows today. But are you ready to embrace that, or do you think I'm this... never going to shake anyone's hand? Ever again. <laughs> I'd never like doing it in the first place. Yeah. Whereas I'm a bit of a handshaker, and I've got to shake that. <laughs> got to shake that off. Um, yeah, I guess. Yeah, there's there's going to be things that's going to feel weird about you know olden times. Mm. Um, I, I guess a bit of handshaking will have gone. There might be a bit more mask wearing, but I mean, of course, it feels good. Touch wood that um, you know we might be able to see each other a bit, and I mean, go to the pub. That'd be nice. Um, go to a show, but it's also weird because now it's been you know a year, and more than a year for the rest of the world. Um, there's there's an element of of being slightly nervous about any good news. Isn't yeah, it? So you yeah, sort of absolutely. every step is a bit like, <clears throat> oh god. But I mean, no, I mean it feels it feels great that we're potentially going to be allowed to do a little bit more because it's been tough. It's been tough for everybody. It's it's um, yeah. And, and I don't think any of us ever imagined in a million years we'd be living through something like this. So yeah, I think the thought of a night out with your mates, you know, is is is, is wonderful, isn't it? You know, mm. and to hug your mates, maybe you know, be lovely. I guess a lot of your interviews have been conducted via looking at a computer, so for yeah. us to be able to do this today, it's it's quite refreshing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. It's felt we've had weeks of like every evening, we would once the kids had gone to bed, uh, we'd had like one or two Zoom interviews scheduled with journalists from Europe or other parts of the world and um, talk about our, our our little record. It's been quite nice just to see Andy. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we'd have a beer, but there'd always be a journalist there too. And then talk about what we're doing, and then, then that would be it. Yeah, you know, that would be our, that, nice, in some ways nice. that would be our social interaction for. Mm. You know. Yeah, you're both um, young, youngish men. Yeah, with, it's definitely becoming with, ish, isn't it? <laughs> we're with, on the ish. Yeah, yeah. with children, um, how's it been for the children? How's it been homeschooling? Challenging. It's been it's been pretty full on. <laughs> yeah, full on. It, it, the thing is, it's not the homeschooling that's really an issue. You know, obviously the schools have you know systems set up that. It's amazing, you know, that in many ways they can be left to themselves. They kind of, you need to be there to steer and make sure they're okay. If, but what it does is it stops you from being able to do your work, you know what I mean, writing songs or, you know, every, you ha that's obviously the, the, the most important thing about the day. So for me and my wife to to work or to do things for our, you know, careers or whatever, uh, you know, that, that takes a back seat. And that's... Um, you know, 90% of the time, absolutely fine. You know, you just crack on and help help out the boys to do their work and stuff. But then, you know, when the slog comes and, it, you know, it's where the frustration can mm. creep in. And know. for you guys, has lockdown enabled you to be more creative, less creative, or about the same? Um, well, I think there's obviously we've all got a lot more time once the kids have gone to bed or whatever but um well it's because it's, it's coming waves of when because the, there's been a lot of time when they were at school yeah that was when well. they, that's right that's when there was i was trying to as i was answering i was like hang on what am i saying yeah yeah it's when they've been at school we've had more time than usual because we've not had to go anywhere 
I don't know. I mean, Tom, I know Tom's been, well, in, well he, he'll tell you he's been doing a lot of work in the studio. I've definitely written lots and lots and lots of songs, but um, whether I've been more or less creative, I don't know. You know, it might be that half of it's absolute rubbish, so it might have been a waste of time. <laughs> time will tell. Time will tell. Time will but tell. yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of songwriting, yeah. for sure. Yeah, well, yeah, when the kids were at school or are, are at school, then obviously the days are free to just, well, write songs because we're not out and about doing interviews or touring. All that's been taken away. Um, but for me, from like the, the other side of what I do, from the band side of things, obviously that's I can write songs for that, but we haven't been together to rehearse and record. So um, you can kind of go so far and you've got a stockpile of material for when we can get together and finish. Um, in some ways, that's why it's been so ace that me and Andy have had this record recorded and had yeah. something to talk about. And yeah, I think you know, we were really lucky. For the want of a better word, you know. We were lucky that we'd had this all in the bag, so to speak. I mean, doing promo in the world of virtual media has been odd, but um, it was great that we got to go to Nashville and record this and do it long before we knew any of this was going to be a thing. Yeah. yeah. Tell me, tell me a bit more about Smith and Burroughs is good enough, and also. How did you come up with the name? I know it might sound a silly question. No, it's fine. Smith and when's Burris? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, did we ever think about having a different name? No, not really. Well, we came up with like endless. No, I mean for Smith and Burroughs. No, I remember being sat in um, that place in. Did we ever Bell consider Burroughs and Smith? No, you told me it was Smith and Burroughs. <laughs> I was like, right. I guess, I guess it's Smith and Burroughs. Um, Shay. Shez, do you remember on in Bell Size? We were in Shez something. Uh, Shez Bob. Shea Bob. Shea yeah, Bob. Yeah, yeah. And you just said, well, it's Smith and Barry's, isn't it? <laughs> I was like, well, I guess so. And that was it. Yeah. We it's, made it, yeah, we made like a wintry, Christmassy record 10 years ago. Um, obviously, we were, we were close friends before then and have continued to. Funny looking angels. Yeah, yeah. We're funny looking angels. So that was the beginning of our musical relationship. Um, since then, we'd always talked about, you know, following that up. We both do other things as well. And, um, Finding the time wasn't easy, but you know when we did have time and it felt right, the song started to materialise. And I think it was about seven years ago, really, that it started to pile up a bit, bit more. And then, yeah, we ended up in Nashville recording the record. Yeah, it's, it's got a nice fit to it, hasn't it? The name Smith and Burrows. You could possibly think it sounds like an estate agent, or, uh, <laughs> or um, we did think about know, selling yeah. property. We yeah, did think yeah, about whether yeah. we should go or an accountancy like, firm. Accountancy, or we something. thought about that. Yeah, we thought yeah. about you know, what about Smith and Western. <laughs> Smith and Western. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. guns, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's you know. yeah. Um, I mean, a gun's cooler than accountants. That, I mean, that's you can talk. About. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we could have been anything. Guns aren't called an accountant. No, they're not. Or are they? Oh, are they? <laughs> um, now it's fully snowing. Yeah, it's pretty good, um, isn't it? We've gone from the beach. It's because we started talking it's about, we started talking about yeah, Funny Looking Angels. Yeah. Ten years since Funny Looking Angels. Mm -hmm. Any reason for the ten years gap? I think, isn't that, I think that's just happened. Because this record, <laughs> this record might have come out last year, originally. Yeah. So, so there, yeah. So essentially, there is a. It, this is just a coincidence. I think that we're now at the ten-year marker. It would take some serious planning, knowing how slow the music industry works, even without a pandemic, to make this record happen exactly yeah. ten years after the first one. Yeah. Um, just took a while. Just took a while to get the songs together, and like I said, we do other mm. things. So, mm. cool. um, and we never had, or have never had, like pressure from um, a label in terms of. I think if you're a band, you release a debut record, it's like, well, come on then, follow up, follow up. Because it was a side project and a Christmas record, to be honest, people never really expected us to follow it up, maybe. Exactly. That was it. But yeah. we always knew we were going to. We were desperate for its follow up. Yeah. We were, the pressure from our, ourselves was immense. Yeah. I love the video, by the way. Watched it cool. the, the, a couple of weeks ago. Which one? The so, Parliament Hill one? Yeah, 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 okay. yeah, really, really cool. Where was that actually shot? Parliament Hill. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. We went back to the. The place where it all started. And what's the story behind that? It was an opportunity to work with um, Matt Whitecross, the director, who is kind of a friend of a friend. We know a little bit, and um, uh, I don't know. We just thought we'd get he'd get the music, get the song, get the vibe, and we set it in the tr track. And he came back with an idea of using the kind of um, theatre group from um, from Swiss Cottage, mm -hmm. which is just up the road from Hampstead Heath, which is where Andy and I um, were living when we became mates. Mm -hmm. Um, that part of North London inspired the song. It's a big part of our friendship. And Matt living there, to start asking to use this kind of theatre group from Swiss. It all just, all just felt wonderfully apt and wonderfully perfect. Mm. And, and Matt's kind of um, 
just getting the tone of it perfect, you know, to have the puppets, to, and, but to still have a kind of sadness to it and um, yeah. a kind of sense of other world. Yeah, I thought it was extremely, it, it, it told a story, it was really watchable. At one point I thought, is this somewhere in the Cotswolds? I was right. thinking. So, yeah, but, that would have been magic. Yeah. But I think we thought this has got to be, Yeah. this has got to be on Parliament In Hill. ten years' time when we follow up Only Smith & Burroughs is Good Enough with our record as an ode to Cotswolds. The, the Five Valleys, yeah, yeah. we'll let you know. Mm. Maybe that time we'll have a, a video on Selsley Common. What are the five valleys? Tell me. Is it not just the valleys that come off from Stroud? But yeah, yeah but who's got? Him. Have you got? Do you? What, you're putting him on. Or? You're putting him on oh. the spot now. Oh God! Oh, I don't know what they know with Slad Valley's one, right? Yeah. Um, Ash, sure. I'm. I'm. I'm not great. You, you, come on, you, you can't have one I'm, between I'm the two of you. Yeah. Yeah. Slad. I don't know what. Brimskin. Brimskin. Okay. Yeah. Talking of the five valleys. Tom, it's a yeah. big part of your life. Can you tell me a little bit about your time here? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, my Well, my folks moved out here when I was four. So, my mum and dad taught at Archway School. And I was here, um, yeah, I went, did my GCSEs and A-levels at Archway. Went, and then that was about it from about, well, then I took a year out. I went to university about 99, 2000. Um, and then what's that? Twenty years ago. Mm. Flown uh, by. Yeah, about twenty years later, I moved back with my family and two kids. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, so I had, I don't know, uh, a great childhood here. Um, but in my late teens, definitely wanted to escape, <laughs> and then had that whatever reason I didn't expect to have that calling of coming back and. I remember um, about four or five years ago, because I'd obviously come back to see my mum and dad who still live here in South Worcester, see him a lot. And I came back and I did the Stroud, not the Stroud half marathon, I did the Stroud, it's like a tra trail, yeah, that yeah, marathon. Yeah. It was a beautiful day. That's and tough, that's a tough one. It was a tough one, but I was reminded of how, you know, beautiful this part of the world is. And um, so I'm just laughing at the snow. Um, and I don't know, And my yeah. uh, the bass player and editors actually got married um, up uh, just outside Horsley, and a few, a few kind of like you know, I'll come back here with my family and be like, oh yeah, then let's start looking at houses here. But um, I, I, I guess it's quite a natural thing for anyone at a certain time in their lives to you know, mm. to come back to where you feel most familiar with, um, or a way of life that's more familiar, perhaps, or a slower pace, you know. Yeah. Because we all get slower as we get older, don't we? Yeah. So Andy, Tom's the reason for you being in this part of the woods. Yeah, well, pretty much. I mean, yeah. I, I grew up in Winchester in Hampshire. I think you say that's a similar feeling. It's a similar feeling for sure. And I think my, you know, we weren't, you know, my, my wife and I decided that moving back home home wasn't for us, which, although I totally agree with what you mm. just said about the pull that happened. And the same thing happened, really. We've just moved back to a different area that feels very similar and very beautiful and a bit slower pace. Yeah, and you mentioned to me off camera, you know, some of the places you've been around Stroud, like the Crown, you love the Crown and Scepter. Well, although I haven't been well, able to did go not properly, have a pub. No, no. Um, but I yeah. went in there the other day to order, no, what do, what do they do? They do the takeaway. Yeah, oh, yeah. corner shop. And I, yeah. yeah, it's brilliant in there, yeah. amazing, and I've, so I've, I've booked, a, booked what, what, whatever I was allowed to book, an outdoor yeah. table for sure. next week. So, Tom, have you acted as his sort of Stroud tour guide at all, really, to the places, like a little tourist well, information? One stop. I'm always here for advice, Andy. I feel like Tom, Tom, <laughs> Tom uh, you know, Tom and Ed are great friends of ours, and we've known each other for a long time. And I feel like they've, we know that they're there. They they showed us a few things last summer, and, but I think at the same time we've not wanted to kind of be too. Hello, we're here at the end of the garden. We've moved as well. <laughs> so we, you know, we we, we sort of. It's quite nice, really. It's been quite a nice balance, hasn't it, of yeah. hanging out a bit and learning a few things together, and and but at the same time we we're pottering around and working a few bits out. We'd have definitely done more if we were able to. Yeah, mm. we would. Have, um, me and you would have certainly done a, a lot more pubs. We had a good dinner at um, the Stroud Brewery, didn't we? Yeah, that was great. Yeah, and we a good thing down there. And we went to a lovely Ambly Arms. Uh, Ambly Inn. We were Ambly Inn. Yeah. How did your friendship evolve over the years? Take take me back to when you first sort of bumped heads. Well, we, we, we met at Glastonbury in 2005, um, but it's a very, very hazy to non-existent memory um, for me, anyway, because I think we played a later show than you. I, so have, I, think, an, to be I fair, have an image in my head of us sat at a bench, and I don't know if it's just because it's, I mean, as I get older, my, my memory's awful, mm. really awful, but um, 
I do remember sat at um, a bench after your show because mm -hmm. I remember Johnny was really excited, right. like, buzzing around doing his Johnny yeah. thing, and I was just in. They just headlined the second stage, and we played earlier in the day, and and you knew my then girlfriend, now wife, and we were just chatting. But I do remember. But I think that's because there's a few photos, not right. of us together, but of that of bench, that night, of that bench, at that time, very exciting time. Editors first, Glastonbury, Glastonbury Festival that I'd gone to since '97 as. Um, I know the place where I realised what I wanted to do. You know what I mean. It's mm. an important place to me for mm. me. Um, so yeah, that's where we first bumped, bumped, bumped into, into each other. other. Yeah, and then we just started. I mean, I guess we just because we we're both on the same circuit for a while mm. of both gigs and awards and socialising and whatever. And oh, been so many award shows. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> we, went, we, we went to one award show together, and neither of us won anything. Um, but you had a good time. Yeah, we had a good time. We had a good time, and then we started a couple of years after that. I was I released a, um, a, a little solo album for charity, and we were doing a bit of promo. And Tom, I can't remember how Tom offered it up, but he basically offered up his services to come along as a as a pal and play yeah. on the radio with me and stuff. And we that's how it started, yeah. isn't it? And then yeah, totally. then you started joining my band on stage to sing "Wonderful Life." Yeah. And then fast forward a couple of years, and we decided to go and mess about in the studio and just see. See what happens. Yeah, At school, I played the trumpet for a while, and I can't remember exactly when, but um, it was about the time kind of being 14, 13, 14, and so this is about 1994. Mm. Um, wow. uh, things like Oasis and Blur, and when that Britpop thing happened, it exploded, that made me pick up the guitar, and my dad taught me a few guitar chords, and I stopped playing the trumpet. Um, and just started writing songs in my bedroom on my own, <laughs> you know, yeah. spending too much time on my own yeah. upstairs. And then, um, and then from like night, like I said, when when I was a bit older, ninety seven, went going to Glastonbury, and um, you know, reading the Enemy, and just really kind of, I think when you first um, fall in love with pop music, and it's very exciting and fun. And then I think for some people there comes a time in you perhaps your mid to late teens where it becomes about identity and about kind of something more than just. Um, you know, you find a sense of belonging, don't you, in, in certain bands and scenes, and and going to Glastonbury and seeing things like Radiohead, and um, and you want to look like them and dress like them, and yeah, stuff. yeah, totally, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 powerful thing, yeah. So, how did your sort of break? How would you say your break came? Where was it? so what well, break? Um, I how did my break come? I bet I, I played with a few people around Stroud and kind of. A level time, mm. um, and then you know that didn't come to it was fun, you know, don't get me wrong, but it just it did its thing. And then after A levels, which I did, I did quite well at GC GCSEs, A levels not so well. And then I kind of I worked in a I took a year out and worked in a um, a factory out the back of uh, Morrison's in um, in Nailsworth for a year just to go around get some pocket money. What's a factory? It is an injection molding plastic factory. It was very, um, you wouldn't understand. No, I don't understand. I'm <laughs> um, confused. Yeah. Um, anyway, it made you the man you are today. It, I just wasn't in a rush to go no. to university, but when I eventually went to university, I did a uh, music technology course, which um, wasn't that music y, kind of in a strange town. But I just went, I wanted to meet people that wanted to be in studios and wanted to maybe form a band. And I, you know, I met the guys that ended up forming editors with and uh, the break we were playing in Birmingham quite a bit met some people there who also now live in Stroud <laughs> who managed the band wow. um, uh, and uh, yeah so the big break, break was meeting them and I guess writing things like Bullets back in, uh, back in that time yeah and Andy for you with how did Razorlight begin for you well I actually auditioned for Razorlight yeah I sort of I was A level in bands A level time in bands and I spent the next and I didn't go to university I just spent the next seven years being in bands and to absolutely zero success, nothing, not even a sniff of a record deal. And then I was just about to give it up, age what 23. Do? I don't know, be miserable. I don't know, I don't know what I was going to do actually, but I had made my peace. I remember that, I remember clearly being like, you know what, I don't think this, maybe this doesn't happen for mere mortals. Because I had given, you know, I'd, I'd given it since, I mean, I got really stuck into the bands earlier on, but then Ray's like, drummer left right at the start of their journey. So I just, and I had never done an audition like that. I never answered anything in the paper before. 
Or is it just in the paper? Well, I no, actually, it's better than that. I went and recorded <laughs> some drums for the Lemonheads producer, Julian Standen. And he was like, I can't pay you any money. And I was like, oh, wicked. <laughs> um, get on my drums back. Yeah, okay. On the, and, and he said, um, but I'll, I'll email all my industry contacts, which I thought sounded a bit like whatever. But by the time I dr drove down the M3 and got home, I had an email in my old Hotmail, Andy Burrows 3006 at hotmail.com, saying, um, you know, uh, th this band Ray's Light, if you go and check them out, you'll probably find them everywhere. The, um, the lawyers just emailed me saying, yeah, we could do with a drummer. So this email that you sent out saying, I know a drummer, mm. worked. So I kind of got in through the back door, but then actually I had to spend the weekend doing auditions and stuff. And, and then it just went absolutely nuts. So, so not a similar path to Tom then? You well, I think you if didn't I was, work in an injection moulding factory? No, I didn't work in it. I worked in a pub. Yeah. That was my job. But I, did, I suppose it was quite similar, really, in terms of bands. It just so happens that the one I formed uh, as, a, as a young and didn't, wasn't the one that you know, never happened for us. Mm. So I ended up joining a band that were already on the ascent. Yeah. Talk about our sort of formative years uh, growing up and admiring bands and possibly trying to be yeah. like that pers person in the band. How pivotal for both of you guys was um, some of the music shows back in the day? Top of the Pops is one that comes to mind for for my my era, how yeah. buzzy and lively that was. Yeah, massively. Top of the Pops was incredible for, for all of us, I think. Yeah. Even gets, we even sing about it in one of the songs on on, on the record, yeah. Yeah, record. yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Yes, is that the inspiration behind on TV shows? Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. Just kind of, I don't know, that nice feeling of, especially those old kind of Top of the Pops 2 um, shows that they show all the time, which yeah. I know is probably slightly, when we were watching Top of the Pops, it wasn't Top of the Pops 2, it was just yeah. Top of the Pops. But yeah. When you look back at the slightly older ones, that kind of that kind of nostalgic haze they have was mm. kind yeah. of... Um, bit of an inspiration for that song but I remember I mean I think you know and you guys would have appeared on Top of the Pops did Top, yeah. Yeah, we both yeah. Top of the Pops yeah. did, did you see the UK yeah yeah did see the UK um, but obviously when I remember mid to late 90s things like uh, the word the TFI white Friday TFI Friday good. huge the oh. white room um, Jules Holland yeah Top of the Pops see the UK on Saturday morning, it was just the video show, and they showed the videos. And uh, do you remember the chart, like, the chart show? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I remember sometimes you get like the rock show That's or the right. indie yeah, show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, they'd, yes, they'd and they'd be like half an hour they? of like, like this week is the rock show. Yeah, I remember seeing like old REM videos on that. Mm. Mm. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but Thursday night was just yeah. a special time with your parents as well, wasn't it? It, yeah. was, a, it was a sit down with the folks and uh, watch the show. Yeah. It's yeah. weird, it was a big enough deal when they chose to change it to Friday, let alone it's gone. Mm. You know mm. what I mean? It feels it feels very odd to not... Mm. I mean, obviously, there's an entire generation of people that have got a clue what we're talking about, no. but it's, it's very... <laughs> uh, it's a real shame that it's not around, because it was, it was an amazing show. Yeah. Still, there's legs to bring it back, I think, isn't there? There's a potential that it, uh, it could happen who, again. Who knows? So. I mean, you like to think so. I mean, I always remember, because I think both Andy and I very much were kind of, especially at that time, more... Uh, indie or alternative mm -hmm. you know what I mean like the bands for the most part uh, the bands you know didn't have much in common with the Spice Girls or uh, you know whatever was more pop at that time but at Top of the Pops they'd be next to each other do you know what I mean mm. it's even more exciting that you'd have suddenly you'd have yeah. um, something from obscurity come and be next to um, yeah. enormous something names you know, um, and were you allowed to play live or did you did you demand that you played live? Because obviously back in the 80s, Top of the Pops was very much um, miming, wasn't it? Top of the Pops, when we did it, uh, I mean, I think it's different for everyone that... We did both. So right. I think, I think you, they, they, they like you to... Um, they went through a phase of, of the bands playing live. I don't know if that was our time. When we did it, I sung live, but we mm. mimed yeah. the playing. Yeah. I much yeah. preferred that. It's funny because all the, all of my band didn't like miming and got really up on their high horse like, it needs to be live. And I was like, I love miming. Because yeah. you could just be out. I always thought that, you know, because Top of the Pops wasn't the place to see live. You need to TFI Friday was obviously live, uh, you know, early. In the, but then you'd have Jules Holland or, yeah. you know, obviously Glastonbury being a big TV thing now these days. You know, mm. there's plenty of time to see yeah. live performances. But Top of the Pops, I never, never was a problem no. for me. That, you know, I love the miming. When, when did you guys both last play Glastonbury and do you hope to do it again if it's... I haven't Hello. played Dustin. You've not oh, played. actually, no, yeah, well, no, yeah, I've, sorry, you did, I played but you Dustin. couldn't remember. No, I have, I played it, yeah. last, yeah, I played it with Tom O'Dell in 2016, oh, okay. and We Are Scientists just before that, so I thought I hadn't played it, but I have. Mm. Yeah, we were booked to play it the year that editors were playing it, the year it got first got doesn't that mean, time. It, doesn't that mean mm. that you will play it then, next year, probably? 
there are, there will be discussion. Maybe, right, maybe, know, yeah. maybe not. I don't know. Um, so yeah, we were playing the other st- the other uh, the John Peel stage um, the year that COVID mm. took away our summer. Mm. So and the time before that, yeah, I mean it was about the same time as I think it might have been. We might have played it when you played with scientists. Yeah, about it. you did. Yeah, we were. Yeah, I've been so lucky. Yeah, been so lucky to have. I don't know. Maybe we played like eight times over the years. Mm. Maybe. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what is it like to perform in front of that many people? Uh, it's um, what goes through your mind when you. I mean, in front of a crowd that vast. Yeah, I mean, the first couple of times. Um, I mean, you can branch the question out slightly to just playing, I guess, kind of festivals, because, you know, that we editors have played a lot of European festivals, and we would normally play one or two a weekend, from, you know, May to September, <laughs> and have done for the last fifteen years of my life, really, pretty much until they got taken away. So. There are so many to play, so that, that, that feeling of getting in front of a big crowd took a long time to get used to and to feel confident and um, it wasn't until we were on our third record that I really felt, you know, it, that was a place where I could actually be, not myself, but just relax. Mm. Um, but with Glastonbury, because of its significance to my life, you know, going there and playing there for the first time yeah. and um, because that festival is so different from any of the others, um, it was, you know, it's incredible. You know, it's, it's all those things, you know, you've got the flags, you know, We've played when the sun's gone down and it's gone dark, and um, I've been in the crowd and had bands play for me in that those slots and had my life changed by musicians, you know. Um, so to and be do on the stage. You, do incredible. you see the faces when you're you're playing, or is it just a lot of heads? Do you <laughs> focus on people's faces, or how how, do, how does it feel when you're up there? I don't the tend to focus on, on people's faces because no. they tend to put me off. I just um, forget words and things like that and suddenly yeah. feel a bit stupid. And is it more nerve-wracking playing in front of a couple of hundred thousand people or 50 people? Or is there no difference? No, I, I don't know. Yeah, I've, I've been more nervous at much smaller gigs than I have playing huge gigs and vice versa, so I don't really... You get, like, the whole thing... Weird. Yeah, the whole thing gathers momen- momentum. So, like, you're with a band for a summer and you're, you know, you you might do, I don't know, I don't, maybe a month of rehearsals, whatever, and the whole thing, the crew, you have a busy summer, and you, the whole thing just becomes mm. like a, a circus, you know, and you just, okay, you're on stage in half an hour, on you go, it's a huge crowd, and you try to, and then off you come, and on to the next, it just becomes, because it's a routine, it, it becomes a bit more comfortable. Sometimes those smaller ones, because they're normally one-offs, or maybe they're, maybe they're an acoustic show, I find them so much more terrifying yeah. because there's less of that kind of circus to make you feel I think comfortable. I feel, I think I feel, uh, I think the smaller ones make me more nervous. Yeah. As you can see, and I've done, and believe you me, I've done a lot of, more of them in recent years. Uh, they're, 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 you know, you, you can see everybody. Mm. And I think like Tom just said, sometimes it's better not to. And is it the before bit that's the terrifying bit? Once you're actually there doing your thing, you, you, yeah. the, the nerves have gone. It depends how it's going, really. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, it, if it's a shocker, the n- nerves often stay with you till you're off. Yeah. <laughs> and do you analyse afterwards as well? You have like a post-match uh, thing, like a football thing. Well, I guess Tom's gigging life has been a bit more consistent than mine. So you know, you know what I mean. So you're probably a better place to answer because I've, I, I, you know, mine's been all over the shop. Different bands, different instruments. Yeah. So I have different reactions. I don't think. You did, we've done so many that I think doing that kind of post-show analysis, break, yeah, it yeah. seems a bit yeah. you too to me. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it is just a show in a moment in time, and mm. um, <laughs> you know, if there's a, some glaring cock up that needs address, of course you will talk about it. But I mean, sometimes you might um, have a little look on YouTube if the video's there and just yeah. make sure everyone's in tune. Sit on, on the on the download, and, you know, and, and then I'll you, just fire them. And how do you feel about <laughs> it when you? How do you feel about it when you watch one of your videos that you've created? Do you enjoy it, or are you the sort of people that don't really want to watch yourselves? I'm not that bothered about watching myself. Uh, I think it would be bizarre to spend a lot of time watching, watching yourself. Watching yourself, yeah. But if you've had a show that's truly um, special, and a, and a, a, for whatever reason, it really is. Mm out of the ordinary and has meant something to your or your career as a significant step and then you might sit and go, oh, I should probably yeah. check out what we did that night. You know. so, so what was that moment you said earlier that sort of a, a music changed your life? Well, or? watching bands, uh, um, you know, uh, that time of like kind of 1997, mm. um, 98, the Glastonbury Festival, going to gigs at the Guild Hall at the Ledge Centre in Gloucester. Yeah. Um, just 
falling in love with that whole culture and the power of music and live music and um, you know Glastonbury in particular was a very special place and seeing Radiohead there in 97 was one that always jumps to mind and I remember seeing R.E.M. not long after there, there as well and um, you know those bands are very important to me. Yeah. How about you Andy? In terms of gigs um, yeah. bits of music? I, yeah that's really hit you in the heart. I mean it wasn't quite as cool as Tom because I wasn't there but I always remember coming home from school and watching Glastonbury 95 on the telly that's the first time I'd watched mm -hmm. that and like the Phoenix Festival I mean, going to festivals obviously is like a mind-blowingly awesome experience when you're in your teens. But I, because I never really got to go much until I got to play them, I just always remember sitting in my living room and just being, it just looked like a different world to me. It looked like a completely, I couldn't even imagine mm. being there. Yeah. So it was always a bit of a dream. I always remember like, even just like the back, the back pages of the music rags just the festival lineups when they would come out was so exciting, like the yeah. Phoenix Festival, yeah. or you know, just to see the Reading Festival. Oh my God! You know, yeah. And they take and they take weeks, months. Some of them sometimes they wouldn't even sell out at all. Just mm. back then. Yeah. How much in the last year have you sort of missed the buzz of performing live to people? Yeah, massively. I think a lot more than I realised in the first few months. I think in the first few months, because none of us knew how long any of it was going to be. I think we were probably all be like, oh, it's quite nice at home for a bit. <laughs> But yeah, I've missed it massively. And, yeah. I think it's been a real shame for this record for us not to be out and about. Yeah. Yeah. Just doing, you know, just a load of little shows, but just to see faces and... See do, some reaction. Yeah. Yeah. Or and feel some reaction. Yeah. You kind of get a better sense of um, how things, how songs are going down, if you can... Mm. Sometimes it's like, do we even release a record? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Because, yeah. like, yeah. you know... Uh, you know, it's, it's quite hard, you know, to get that tangible, yeah. to get applause. We just yeah. love applause. We're needy. But um, <laughs> in terms of, um, for the editor side of things, I miss, I miss yeah, I miss mm. my brothers mm. and that's, that side of things as well. You know, I haven't seen them for a long time. Yeah. How have you guys sort of structured your lives? We've all had to adapt, haven't we? And we've, some people have taken up bizarre hobbies or started eating something they've never eaten before. I drink coffee at 10 o'clock at night. I've never done that before. Oh, so, yes. which is really... Rock and roll, but Very rock yeah. And roll. But is there anything different you guys have done um, apart from obviously your music? I don't think there's anything different, really. I've done. I mean, I guess living in, living a bit more of a rural lifestyle is something that we're doing. But yeah, uh, adjusting to being out, out of London and yeah. having a new life has been mm. uh, yeah happened in tandem with this thing happening, hasn't it? So, just uh, sort of finally, really. Where do you, the music industry has obviously been hit like a, a lot of businesses in the last year. Where do you see music moving forward now? Well, I think in terms of some of the people that is probably really affected, like the roadies. The roadie crew and yeah. all that stuff, yeah. yeah. I mean, well, in, at the moment in this country, things are starting to feel a little bit more optimistic in terms of the late summer and beyond. You know, what that will mean, I don't know how like the, the 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 logistics of having a festival or how they're going to specifically do things but they're, they're going ahead guns blazing that they're going to start doing shows again so i think um if that does happen there's going to be a lot of gigs in a short period of time yeah i um, think i think that's true i think mm -hmm. if this if anything does open up and if it does go even <clears throat> slightly in the direction that we all hope i think you can definitely rest assured there's going to be a a, a live music boom of some sort because everyone's just i hope so because like you say like to get out and play and watch gigs like some of our crew like this when this thing hadn't been off the road for 30 years mm. they do a tour with editors they go so you know they hadn't been at home for more than four days for mm. Uh, mm. that you know so um you know lots of them have been retraining and doing other things to make ends meet but um yeah like if when you get yeah. back out there on the road how, how are you going to embrace it or are you a bit freaked by it uh, I mean, I'm. I mean, I'd just be up for it and excited. Yeah. But I, I understand. It's going to be weird, isn't it? It's yeah, it's definitely extent. going to be weird. Yeah. I mean, it's weird. You know, when we met today. Yeah, yeah, it's weird, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm sure we'll get. You know, I'm not a massive fan of all the new terms and the word. No. You know, like you know, the new normal and stuff. But I guess there's. This has been a massive life-changing event, and there are mm. some things that are going to be different, and um, that's not necessarily yeah. awful. Like Tom said, he didn't want to take anyone's hand anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, Definitely not. Right. The funny thing is, though, I mean, ten years, fifteen years down the line, 
you'll be telling your kids about this time, won't you? When it, yeah, you know, because yeah. so, their kids are obviously, would you say they're pretty much oblivious to it, or do you think they get a little bit of a vibe from it? I know definitely yeah. get a vibe from it. I, mean, I think the, the, Tom and I both got kids of similar ages, or at least the the older two are, and mm. I think that it must have really sucked for them and all the kids, you know, the teenagers and all that. Um, the little our, my, our little one, we've got one that's five, and she's, I think she's had a great time getting all this attention, mm. and we've tried to make it quite fun. So I'm not sure she'll remember it as being quite such a pivotal sort of, you know, blow. Mm. But I, even, even that age, you're going to be like, what was that weird time where we were just at home forever and you were my teacher and you yeah. were awful at it? Yeah. Oh, I, don't think I think I was that. rubbish. I made a good um, robot out of toilet roll. <laughs> but apart from that. I'm going to do one more finally. I want to talk about football. Right. Um, you're an Arsenal fan. Yeah. Forest Green's on your doorstep for both yes. of you. Yeah. You've want to go there. So you've not had a chance to go, I guess, guys. No. Oh, yeah. I have you been? I thought you no, might no, have been. No, no, no. no yeah. Not had a chance. Really would love to back. go there. Uh, I do just drive past it and it's Obviously, wicked. in the time that I was out of Stroud, mm. in you know, Forest Green is it was a always a thing. Club. It was a yeah. small club, really. yeah. but it's obviously become this um much more than the club and I'm very aware of their um ethos and read everything that's going on with great interest I think it's wonderful obviously Hector Bellerin is um, invested and he's obviously Arsenal right back at the moment and uh, yeah it, I'm, I'm very intrigued to get down there and, and, and watch a game yeah. yeah are they a club that you keep an eye on the results yeah, as yeah, well now yeah yeah, 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 yeah. so uh, I mean I know their ascension has, has been fairly rapid over the last mm. you know five six years or whatever so, and yeah. the ethos as well probably is interesting for you the club. as well yeah yeah, yeah well it's, yeah, it's brilliant yeah. what it, i mean yeah i feel like he had a it's a large reason for the sort of the stroud you know the it's, it's very much associated with this area isn't it that yeah. football club and yeah. what they're up to it's amazing yeah. it is amazing yeah i mean when dale rescued the rescued the club i think that was primarily his thing you know mm. he was asked to save it and it's just almost been probably a happy accident mm. yeah he's been able to green up football yeah mm. club with the conscience mm. all that. yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. it's Great. inspiring yeah Right, lovely guys. Really good to meet you. Nice to meet you. And, nice to meet um, you. Thank you for having yeah, us. We'll stay in touch. And Absolutely, yeah. All the best. Thank Absolutely. you. Cheers, mate. Cheers.